Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the World on Fire podcast. I am your host, Nick Schweitzer. Um, before we jump into the new series over the U.S. 8th Air Force in Europe, I'd really like to take a time to give a little bit of background on why exactly we are doing the podcast. It just so happens I myself am a veteran of the United States Air Force, uh, which is really one reason why I'm incredibly excited to talk about this next topic that we're going to go over. Um, for many years, um, even from the time I was a child, I had an incredibly large passion uh, for World War II. Uh, some even get, would say that I got to the point to where I was a hobbyist historian, right? Uh, during the height of the COVID pandemic in 2020, I ended up running across at Arizona State University and they have a master's degree in World War II studies. Um, I immediately decided to jump on it and I enrolled. And two years later, in December of 2020 year, or 22, I graduated from the program. Um, now here I am, doing what I can to teach the next generation of World War II aficionados. Um, so no matter if you're an avid World War II reader, a uh, hobbyist historian like I was, or possibly a young historian in training, if you will, um, or simply if you're here to learn something new, I hope this podcast scratches that itch after. And now, without further ado, our first episode in our new series over the U.S. 8th Air Force. It's January 27th, 1943. Over 900 airmen from the 309th Bombardment Group of the United States 8th Air Force are awaiting their instructions at RAF Thurley in Bedfordshire, England. Ten men from each plane, a total of 91 crews are in attendance. However, this pre-flight briefing is much different than the ones before. Normally, the crews of B-17s will be escorted by American and British fighters as far as possible. They'll bomb their target and be escorted back under the safety of those fighters. However, this is a hindrance to the war effort. Allied fighters simply cannot make it the full length to Germany. Therefore, no bomber has made it into the interior of the Nazi empire, at least the Americans. And that ends today. The Mighty Eighth, as they would soon be named, would be carrying out the first unescorted daylight bombing campaign over the skies of Germany. Fighters would escort them as far as they could and then break off, leaving the aircraft completely alone at 25,000 feet. And at 6 a.m., the planes roar to life and take flight. Their target, the U-boat pins at Williamshaven, 56 B-17s would be in formation for the bombing run, catching the Germans completely off guard. 53 of those would successfully make it to and hit their target. Unfortunately, they would lose three bombers. However, this is a total success. But with the surprise now gone, the Germans are now prepared to take the fight to the skies. Unescorted high-altitude daylight bombing has officially begun. And so, so let's take what we're actually going to be looking at in this series, which is the unescorted high-altitude bombing, right? The, the daylight bombing campaign. Um, that the Americans put in place and was kind of their main um, push when it came to aerial combat in World War II. And while it was a fact that the Japanese had first made the strike against the United States on December 7, 1941 at Pearl Harbor, uh, the United States government and military leadership quickly put Nazi Germany in their sights and they had had them there for a long time. Um, they were the primary target of this new world war. And while there's much to be said about the why, such as um, allyship or just global positioning, uh, the biggest reason is that the Americans felt that the Japanese were much more inferior of an enemy and posed a much less of a risk than the allies felt that the Germans were in Europe. Yet, by the beginning of 1941, the United Kingdom had already been well into the war with Germany and had become accustomed to the Nazis' all-out war. Uh, in the October 
previously in October of 1940, the British had taken to the skies over their own nation to beat back wave after wave of Luftwaffe fighters and bombers. The Battle of Britain proved one thing for certain, and that was in order to win this war, you needed to control the skies. Now, the United States Army Air Corps was not, they were not the first allied country to attempt um, bomb to bomb Germany during the daytime. Unescorted bombing wasn't a new thought. It had been practiced before. Um, the Army Air Corps Tactical School brought the concept to life in the 1930s at Maxwell Airfield in Alabama. Soon after they presented it to the United States Navy and the Navy quickly rejected it um, in lieu of their dive bombing campaign, which was in its own light incredibly successful. However, there was an organization that would be willing to test this new daytime bombing strategy, and that was the Royal Air Force. While they were as in the early parts of the war, so much so that Winston Churchill felt as if they were simply sending the Air Force to be murdered over the skies of Western Europe, leading to the retreating of the daylight bombing campaign. They, they started to pull back from it and really um, refocus to their nighttime bombing. Um, and eventually the RAF would change their course completely and only bomb at night. Um, while bombing at night would prove to be much, much safer for these bomber crews, it would also prove that bombing at night was much more ineffective as bombs would miss their targets just solely based off of poor visibility. It would always be a guess to the crews as to if they were over the target or not, uh, leading to an area bombing tactic. Uh, think about it, just make a box, right? We know that there's, um, let's say, aiming directly for a factory or a rail yard or a U-boat pin or something along those lines. Um, instead of saying, we know that it's right here, we're going to aim for this specific exact spot it more or less became, okay, we know it's in this area. We're just going to bomb the entire area. Um, so in, in a theory, it would be like bracket bombing. Uh, and um, it, it was successful. Uh, you can't lie and say that it was not. Um, without the night bombing, um, the, out, the, the daytime bombing that the Americans would do would no, not be anywhere near as successful as it was. Um, so you can't discredit the fact that nighttime bombing was effective. Um, now let's look at the British bomber of the time. Um, Royal Air Force's main bomber is that of the Arvo Lancaster. The, the elite heavy bomber could easily, easily reach across Western Europe, yet it only had eight 303 machine guns and virtually no defensive armor. Uh, the British simply could not withstand the precision attacks from the Luftwaffe during the day and without escort. However, the Americans had something they highly believed in. An aircraft that could take to the sky far and wide, take a hell of a beating, even better, could fight back. The Americans had developed the B-17. Now let's take time out here and discuss what the big deal is about the B-17 bomber. If you follow World War II at all, You've definitely heard of the B-17. If you like aviation at all, you've heard of the B-17. It, it's, it's kind of like a household name in general. Like I feel like that almost everybody, if someone says, oh, that's a B-17, most people are going to have a pretty good idea of what you're talking about. Um, and, and why exactly did it become the legend that we know it is today? Um, it was first designed and built in 1937, the Boeing B-17 would become the predecessor to American bomber warfare as we know it today. It came in at an astonishing length, 74 feet long, 103 feet wide, had an empty weight of 36,000 pounds. It also had four 1,200 horsepower engines with 11 50 caliber machine guns covering every angle of approach a fighter could have. The bomber was armed to the teeth with any crewmen that manned it. The plane is also designed to take an absolute beating 
the focus of design on survivability of intense flak and cannon fire. The plane is a beast, simply put, and rightfully earns its nickname, the Flying Fortress. Not only does the B-17 have the firepower to protect itself, it can also do something that the Lancaster cannot. It can reach 35,000 feet if need be. While much slower, it is much more defendable. And this could be the plane that could complete the daylight bombings with great success. And it was the piece that the Americans would use to convince the British. And while we have covered the what, if you will, of what is taking place and what the Allies are trying to accomplish, what we have not truly talked about yet is who are the ones that are pushing for this. Now, we must remember that flight in World War II has only been around for 40 years, right? give or take some. Um, the only war to date with an ex a lot of aerial combat is World War I, which was fought with biplanes and balloons that in World War II, it, it would not stand a chance. In a way, the United States Army Air Corps was simply an untrusted, underdeveloped baby that everyone was cautious about. Army leaders felt that if that an Air Force simply would not play a large enough role in the war, um, this is just looking back at World War I. However, there were men within those ranks that felt incredibly different about that. And one of them, which is a legacy of the modern U.S. Air Force, um, and I, he I actually have his emblem on my airman's coin from when I graduated basic training. And um, that is Henry Hap Arnold. Um, he's a general in the United States Army. And Hap is one of the major front runners for this unescorted daylight bombing campaign in Europe. And in the sense of um, what he's faced with, he's no stranger to that danger or high heat. Um, the 57-year-old West Point graduate and World War I aviator, aviator is not afraid to voice his opinion. Um, he was trained by a gentleman of the name of General Billy Mitchell. And Billy Mitchell was such an, an, a stubborn but successful general that he was actually court-martialed um, by basically the entirety of the Army due to his excessiveness right? and one of the people that went in to defend him was Pat. so this isn't anything new he has went above and beyond before preaching how important these missions these bombing runs how important aerial combat is to the success of modern warfare now this actually works out for Hap. By the time World War II comes rolling around, he is put in command of all U.S. Army Air Forces. And he plans to do something about it. In 1943, the Casablanca Conference started, and more specifically January 14th, so at the very beginning of the year. And Half Arnold has become incredibly overwhelmed with the rumors that British Prime Minister Winston Churchill has an agenda during the Casablanca conference to shoot down the American proposal to enact this bombing strategy. Um, and he plans on convincing U.S. President um, Franklin Delano Roosevelt to join the RAF in their area, um, area bombings at night. Hap Arnold quickly sends a panic message to a close confidant and friend, uh, Major General Ira Ecker. Uh, a fellow World War I fighter pilot who was now in command of the 8th Air Force. And he basically told him, do whatever it takes to change the prime minister's mind. In a fury, Ecker sets down and do, does probably what he does better than being a general. And that is writing. Prior to World War I, Ecker has earned a degree in journalism from USC or the University of Southern California and is known for his remarkable penmanship. And he quickly wrote a memo to Churchill informing him of the retraining costs, the risks, the time it would take 
to switch the U.S. Air Forces around to do these nightly bombings and to join the Royal Air Force in them. But more importantly, there was one thing that Ecker put in the memo and that he points out, and it's what grabs Churchill's attention and ultimately changes his mind. Ecker states in the memo, if the RAF continues night bombing and we bomb by day, we shall bomb them around the clock and the devil shall get no rest. With that, Churchill agrees. He's, he firmly believes we shall beat them constantly around the clock. And with that, high altitude unescorted bombing into German territory was officially given the green light. And less than two weeks later, on the 27th, three days after the official end of the Casablanca conference, Ecker designates the 8th Bomber Command's Mission 31, and it would be the first of its kind. And all 91 planes would roll off the tarmac, but as we stated in the very beginning of this, only 53 would reach their target in Williams Haven, and only three would be lost. But this was just a surprise of the first attack. The infamous Luftwaffe was nowhere to be found. They were either stationed in France or fighting on the Eastern Front. There were simply no aerial defenders. Wilhelmshaven was a great success. The Germans quickly realized after this first daylight bombing that if they continued to go unchecked, it would only lead to a critical collapse of the entire country in the war effort. German skies would now be defended with some of the most fierce fighting the war will see. In our next episode, we're going to cover the bloody transition to the bombing strategy and how the summer of 1943 would turn into hell for the crews of the 8th Air Force. More so, how the Luftwaffe turned their heads towards the bombers and how ground defenses would set up an almost impenetrable wall of flag. And I'm, I'm, I'm really trying to decide how deep I want to get into this. Um, the stories from the 8th Air Force, mainly over the skies of Germany, are incredibly deep and detailed. Um, one of the current books that I'm reading is about a waste gunner and ball gunner on a B-17. His name is Maynard Smith. Um, he would receive the Medal of Honor. I feel like I may share some of his story just because of how captivating it is. But what we need to understand before we go into how deep this series can get, we need to understand that I be it German, uh, French, Polish, British, Russian, um, anyone that fought in the skies in World War II took a, a pretty uncalculated risk. The risk was massive. Um, if we look at just the United States, for example, during World War II, the United States Army Air Forces in general lost more men than the United States Marine Corps did in the Pacific Theater facing the Japanese. Now, it's not to say that the fighting was harder. Um, the reality of it is, is if one plane goes down and takes all members with it, you're automatically killing 10 people, which is not an uncommon occurrence, especially in these bombers. Um, if they were to be shot down, um, there's a very high possibility that it would kill them all. Uh, reading through just articles and memoirs of what some of these guys went through. They they speak multiple times about how, you know, only four of them got out or only three of them got out or, you know, it was very rare that all 10 were able to get out of the aircraft safely and return home. So we're going to really dive into what it was like for these guys at 25,000 feet plus. Um, not just on the American side with the 8th Air Force, but we're also going to look at some memoirs from the Luftwaffe uh, and, and, you know, how these lives lined up to fight in this hell 25,000 feet high. 
As always, thank you all so much for listening. Uh, you can follow the show on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram by searching for World War, World on Fire, a history of the Second World War podcast. Um, we post photos, stories, um, and we're hopefully going to give the community an opportunity to interact with us directly. Um, we want you guys to be able to come on board, um, give us tips, give us, hey, talk about this. Maybe you should bring up this, especially when we start really releasing a schedule of what our series are going to look like. And we also want your guys' help. Uh, we want to know what you guys want to hear. Um, just looking at some of the um, the audience statistics, we have a lot of audience members um, in Europe and in and, and France and England, um, Germany. We have some that are in um, Canada, here in North America, we have obviously the United States, but we really want to hear from everybody and, and what you guys want to learn about or hear about, or what do you want shared um, on this platform. Um, and if you haven't, please um, make sure you follow, rate, review the show, and it helps us grow and ultimately reach those others that are possibly interested or want to know more about this war that ended 80 years ago. Um, as always, thank you guys so much, and I will see you in two weeks.